study 1 Corinthians chapter 15 with you this afternoon, if you would like to join me there. I have a lot of the scriptures up on the screen this evening, uh, so perhaps you'd like to follow along, not only the version that I'll be preaching from, but your version that you prefer as well. Um, I know sometimes that can be helpful um, in just kind of filling in some of the definition of the passage. So 1 Corinthians 15 is where we'll be. Uh, you may recall last Sunday when we studied together, we talked about having gratitude for the deliverance that God is going to provide for us one day. We talked about the fact that he has uh, delivered us from bondage and our enemies. We talked about the fact that he is our king. And we talked about the deliverance that will one day come through him as we get to stand before him in robes of white and give him thanks and praise for having brought us through our tribulation to be with him. This evening, what I would like to do is effectively bookend the Thanksgiving holiday um, and build on the final point of our lesson last week uh, using the text of 1 Corinthians 15 to do so. So the chapter opens with the Apostle Paul summarizing what it was that he preached when he first came to the city of Corinth. So in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 1, now I would remind you, brethren, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. Now you might wonder already, what is it that's going on in Corinth that has caused Paul to, to even bring this up, to believe that they are nearing the point of having believed in vain? of their faith coming to nothing after all that's been done. So he then says, here's what I preach to you. Verse 3. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. And then he goes on to talk about a number of different appearances of Jesus. But when you come down to verse 12, you can see clearly why Paul is concerned that some of the Corinthians will have believed in vain. And you can see why he would begin the chapter by reviewing his history of preaching to them the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Because some of the Corinthians have decided that just simply in principle, it isn't possible for someone who is dead to come back to life. So some of the Corinthians are beginning to deny the very idea of the resurrection of someone who is dead. And because of this, Paul has begun by reminding them, Brethren, when I came and preached to you, I preached Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. So do you realize that if you're going to take the stance that the resurrection doesn't happen, Paul says in verse 13, if there's no resurrection from the dead or of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, verse 14, well, that means that our preaching is in vain and even your faith is in vain. It means, verse 15, that, that we're even lying about what God actually promises when we, when we tell you these things. It means in verse 17 that your faith is worthless and you're still in your sins. And it means, according to verse 18, that those who are dead are just gone from us forever. So Paul starts to outline just the catastrophic consequences for the gospel if you deny the resurrection of the dead. But he also says it's not only uh, can have a terrible effect on the nature of the gospel, it also has a very negative effect on the way that, that a person lives their life. So one of the most famous verses from the book of Corinthians is verse 33, bad company corrupts good morals. I wonder sometimes when we quote that verse how many of us remember that this is the context of that statement. This idea that bad associations can ruin good morals comes right in the middle of this discussion of the resurrection. His point then is that if you keep hanging out with these people who deny the resurrection of the dead, it's going to have a terrible effect on the way that you live your life. You're not going to live the kind of holy lives that God has called you to live. The question that you may be wondering as we're looking at this chapter is why exactly is it that the Corinthians are denying the resurrection of the dead to begin with? Why are they struggling with this? 
If you look down through the chapter, Paul never spells the reason for their struggle. He never spells it out explicitly. But I do believe that based on some things he says here, and then things that he says in other places of the Bible, that you and I can deduce at least what a large part of the problem was. In the first century Greco-Roman world, obviously most people were pagans. They were not mostly Jewish, far less mostly Christian. And if you're a pagan, that obviously has a huge impact on how you're going to view the entire world. So if you are Jewish and you follow the God of Abraham, well then you believe that creation is, as that God said, good. You believe that people are made in the image of God. And that this existence you and I have on this earth, embodied souls, is a good existence. It's not the best that God has to offer, but it is a good one. If you are a pagan, though, you don't have a belief in God as creator. Or at the very least, you don't believe anything like what the Old Testament teaches. Instead, you've got various gods who are often in conflicts with one another. And even a lot of the stories claim that creation itself is the result of the aftermath of all the conflicts between the gods. And that just makes a huge difference between how you look at creation and even how you look at the body that you have. So if you're a pagan, this world of matter and your body of flesh and blood is a bad thing to be escaped from one day. But if you're a believer in the God of heaven, then this creation, and specifically this body, is a good thing. It's just in need of redemption and salvation. And included in that redemption and salvation is going to be our bodies. But to a pagan, just the very idea of a resurrection of the dead is ridiculous. Understand, it is a massive downgrade from what they are expecting in their minds. I mean, once my soul finally flies away from this prison of a body, you're going to put it right back in? Why would you do that? You may remember when Paul goes to Athens. Well, that passage isn't there. When Paul goes to Athens and he preaches before the philosophers there, and he's uh, talking with them about all the different idols, and even the, the, the idol that they have to the unknown God, they listen to him. When he talks about the God revealed in creation, they listen to him when he talks about the God in whom we live and move and have our being. But as soon as he brings up the resurrection, remember what happens? Some of them do stick around for more, but others are done. And they start mocking and they, they check out. So in Corinth, what seems to have happened here is that just like with all the rest of their problems in 1 Corinthians, their surrounding culture has begun to permeate their thinking and erode their convictions as Christians with regards to the resurrection of the dead. That at least seems to be part of the problem based on what Paul says here in verse 35. That Someone will ask, however, how are the dead raised? And with what kind of body do they come? So this is going to be the first thing that Paul talks about here, the how of the resurrection. How are the dead raised? And it seems as if what some of these people are saying is, I don't see how it's possible for someone who has died to come back to life, and I certainly don't understand how it's possible for someone who is reanimated in their body to be fit to go and stand before God in heaven for all eternity. Who would want that life? Now, I think... Uh, some of you are going to react, maybe all of you will, I don't know, the way that I kind of do with this passage, where I just wonder how on earth they could possibly struggle with this idea, because of the answer of, well, how can they do it? It's because God, that's how. That's a real obvious answer. So maybe you wonder, how on earth are they struggling with this? That said, our culture is a lot more pagan these days than it is Christian. But it's certainly possible that some of the same questions have puzzled us as it did these people. How is it possible for a lifeless body to come back to life, much less be fit for eternity in the presence of God? Or maybe it is that, that teaching stuff like this seems a bit radical and dramatic because we've gotten used to the world's standards for what is acceptable to think about. And we wouldn't feel reluctant about it if we believed it with every fiber of our being. So maybe, maybe we struggle with it. I don't know. Paul, though, as perhaps you've seen by glancing ahead, 
doesn't seem to have much sympathy for the question. It's subtle, but do you see it? You foolish person. How do you really feel, Paul? You foolish person. So anybody have a teacher that told you there are no foolish questions? Paul disagrees. He says, yeah, yeah, there are. This one right here is a good example. So why does Paul call it a foolish question and the one who would ask it a foolish person? If you'll think about it, in the Bible, somebody who is a fool is not somebody who's just unintelligent. A person who is a fool is a person who excludes God from the picture. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. So what Paul is saying is the only way that you can even ask the question, how is this possible, is if you're not taking God into account, which is inherently foolish. So you have the same kind of problem, remember with the Sadducees in Matthew 22, when they come to Jesus and they think they're going to stump him with this scenario of the, the man who's married and then he dies and his six brothers each proceed one after the other to take up the mantle of caring for his wife and then dying and leaving her care to the next brother, so on and so on. And the Sadducees ask the question, in the resurrection, whose wife will she be then? And you remember what Jesus says to them. He says, you are wrong. You're just wrong. And it's for two reasons. You do not know the scriptures, and you do not know the power of God. That seems to be something of the issue here, doesn't it? These are people who can't conceive of a resurrection of the dead. But here's what Paul says in response to the, the skepticism. He says in verse 36, What you sow does not come back to life, or does not come to life unless it dies. And what you sow is not the body that is to be, but a bare kernel, perhaps of wheat or some other grain. But God gives it a body as he has chosen, and to each kind of seed, its own body. So back in chapter 3, he's describing, he describes preaching the gospel in terms of agriculture. He said, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. It's always God that gives the increase. And what Paul is saying is what you and I would call maybe laws of nature, such as just how plants grow, is the day-to-day -day providence of God in action. So that simple process, Paul says, that that is something that all of us have observed. Maybe we even take it for granted how when a seed is planted into the ground with, with that body, it can still nevertheless emerge from the ground having become something vastly different. If you can understand how God can do that, why would you struggle with this? So when you look at a seed, like the uh, sunflower seeds at the bottom corner of this picture, when it goes into the ground looking like that, just based purely on the appearance of the seed, just considering what that looks like, would you have any idea that someday it would emerge from the ground and grow taller than a person and look like the flower that it does? Not from looking at that little seed, you wouldn't. It just completely transforms in a way that's almost unimaginable. And yet we see that all the time. And so have the Corinthians. And so Paul's point is, is, if you see this process of something buried in the ground and then rising from the ground transformed, if you see that happen all around you in just the due course of God's creation, then why would we think it incredible that God could also take a body that is dead and buried and raise it up and transform it? Especially, as Paul goes on to point out, because we know God has created all kinds of forms. And if he can create all sorts of different bodies for many different environments, can he not create a body that's fit for us for eternity? If you look at verse 39. For not all flesh is the same. There is one kind for humans, another for animals, another for birds, and another for fish. Um... It's pretty impressive already, just the variety of animals that exist out there, just, just on the land. Um, and that's not to mention even when you go down to the microscopic level and see all those organisms, the different shapes they take and the different things that they do. Um, and then try to go back to not thinking about the fact that a billion of them are in the water you're drinking. Um, but then the, the variety of birds that perhaps you've seen on some nature programs, just the colors and the feathers and all the different things that they get up to. But then you haven't even 
begun to talk about the fish in the seas and just the unimaginable variety and vibrance of all the different creatures that God has just simply made. We went to uh, the wild lights over at Columbus Zoo a few days ago, and we took the time to go into the aquarium bit of it. And I am 39 years old, and I still cannot get over seahorses. Things are just, they're incredible. And everything in that um, aquarium is incredible. All these different bodies. He says not all flesh is the same. So, and, and, and as he'll point out here in a moment with the stars, even you know the stars differ from the sun and the moon, but even stars differ from stars. So you know the fish differ from the birds, and both of them differ from the animals, but there's so much variety just within the fish. God did that. He goes on to say there are heavenly bodies and earthly bodies, but the, the glory of the heavenly is of one kind, so that you see the beauty of something, its majesty, the, the way that God has created it. The glory of the heavenly is of one kind, and the glory of the earthly is another. So you think of the beauty of this earth, and all the different features on it, the beauty of the mountains, of the forest, of the rivers, of the seas, just all those different kinds of things. But then you haven't even gotten into the beauty of the heavens. And as for that, verse 41, he says, there's one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, another glory of the stars, and even star differs from star in glory. So according to the book of Genesis, God creates life where previously there was no life. And he creates life with mind-boggling diversity and scatters it across the heavens, or creates all the different bodies, I should say, and scatters those across the heavens, spanning distances that make even terms like mind-boggling inadequate. And then he's made all these countless creations with bodies tailored to their habitats, be it fish in the sea or birds in the air, mammals, reptiles, insects, even the planets and the stars in the sky. And if God can do that, why would we ever think it impossible? Why would we even think it remotely challenging for God who can create life where previously there was no life to then be able to renew life and transform it like the seeds he created? He can call life into existence anytime he wants to. He can't transform life. <coughs> he obviously has the power to make all kinds of life. So that's the simple how of the resurrection. The answer to the question of verse 34, how can the dead be raised, is just, you could just simply say, because God. It's because God can do anything. Creating life is sort of his thing. It's what he does. So the first question of, of how are the dead raised, well, because God can do anything. And then their second question is, well, then what, what sort of body are we going to have? What's that going to be like? Back in verse 35, with what kind of body do they come? So how can God bring to life a body that is, is going to be suited for uh, standing in his presence in heaven? You think, um, first of all, about what our, our current bodies are like. They are, to begin with, perishable. So food goes bad, and our bodies have an expiration date as well. And I realize some monsters can keep milk a few days past the expiration date, but you don't get to keep your body any longer than its expiration date. And when that day comes, you can't do anything about it. Eventually the body gives out. Long before that time comes, though, you think of all the different things our bodies can be subjected to. Think about Paul going into Lystra, being stoned and left for dead. Our bodies are weak. They're subject to illness, to deformity. Perhaps Paul's thorn in the flesh is an example of that. So that's what the body's like in its natural state. It's perishable, it's limited. That's vulnerable. What will the resurrection body be like? Look at verses 42 through 44. So is it with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable. What is raised is imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. So a sunflower surpasses 
the seed from which it grows so spectacularly, it's almost impossible to imagine that one came from the other. But it did. And by God's power, the resurrection body is going to so be so spectacularly different from this body that it will be amazing that one came from the other. But it will, through God's power. And Paul says the resurrection body is not going to be a natural body. It's what he calls here a spiritual body. And at this point, I, I don't know if you've made the same mistakes in Bible study that I have made, but I have to be careful to understand what Paul means here. Um, when he makes a contrast between the natural and the spiritual, I think sometimes we're talking about culture permeating our thinking. For me, I thought, okay, well, I have my body, I have my soul and my spirit. When I get to thinking about spirit, I get to thinking about spirits on TV and ghosts and transparent, <laughs> ethereal, not solid things. Nothing tangible, right? It can't be tangible if it's going to be a part of that realm. That's what I get to thinking. You don't find that idea in Scripture. It is, of course, an absolutely different realm completely separate from the physical, whatever the spiritual realm wherein God dwells in heaven and all that, however all that operates, I don't know a whole lot about. Do you remember all those descriptions in Revelation when God's trying to tell us what everything's like, all the different gemstones that come up? Streets of gold, all the different stones, it's like this, it's like that. It's trying to explain calculus to a toddler, trying to get us to understand what heaven is like. But all these different things, it's similar to what you know in this regard, in some way it is. But this idea that it's going to be this, you know, non-corporeal, intangible, uh, you know, fluttering sheets and smoke sort of existence, that's not what the Bible presents. So just because you go from the natural to the spiritual doesn't mean you're leaving behind all things that are tangible and material. And when Paul talks about the natural and the spiritual body, he's talking about a body that's produced and powered by the natural, ordinary means of life versus a body produced and powered by the Spirit and meant for that realm. To give you an example of this, this kind of language, over in chapter 10, when Paul is talking about the history of Israel and they cross the Red Sea and they head to the Promised Land and the wilderness wandering, he says that all Israel ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink. Is that a metaphor? Or do we know what they ate and drank? They ate manna, and water from the rock was what they drank. It wasn't ghostly, transparent, ethereal food and water. It was manna and quail and water. Why does Paul call it, Paul call it spiritual then? Because it wasn't food and water produced by natural means. God provided supernaturally through the power of the Spirit. And similarly, Paul says the resurrection body is not natural, it is spiritual. It is a body powered by God's own spirit. He says in verse 44, Thus it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam, meaning Jesus, it's a metaphor Paul seems to, to like, became a life-giving spirit. But it is not the spiritual that is first, but the natural, and then the spiritual. The first man was from the earth, a man of dust. The second man is from heaven. As was the man of dust, so also are those who are of dust. And as is the man of heaven, so also are those who are of heaven. And he expounds on that in verse 49. It says, just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. What he's talking about is our transformation into Christ's likeness becoming complete. That's what a resurrection body is going to be like. That's their second question. What's the resurrection body going to be like? What, what, what could it possibly be? And this is the answer. It's a body that is imperishable, glorious, powerful, powered by the Spirit, and like Christ's. That's the answer. And I think, generally speaking, we're all pretty even keel. Um... I, I've preached with a few churches where if they agree with something during the lesson, boy, they let you know it. And it took me a little bit of getting used to the, the interruptions coming in, but then all of a sudden you start to feed off of them. Um, but may I suggest to you, if we believe this, I mean, if we believe it deep down with the indefatigable confidence that's born of faith in Christ, then shouldn't this charge us up? 
If I believe this body is going to be mine one day if I'm found faithful in Him, might that even get us wondering, when can this happen? When can this promise be mine? And that's the third thing that Paul talks about in this passage is the when of the resurrection. So verse 50, I tell you this, brethren, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. The Lord, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. So remember, part of their issue was how could we have a resurrected body that's suitable to be with God? And that's how God's going to transform it. Well, when is that going to happen? Verse 52. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. So Paul says, there'll be this great last blast of the trumpet, this last special appearing of the presence of God in this world, and that is going to initiate this glorious transformation that will take place in a split second and open the door to eternity. And in that twinkling of an eye, Paul says, there are some pretty tremendous promises that are going to be fulfilled. Like in verse 54, when the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written. Whenever Paul quotes from the Old Testament, it's helpful to go back and look at the text he's referencing. In this case, he's quoting from Isaiah 25. These are some verses that recur at the end of Revelation. But in Isaiah 25, verse 6, the text says, On this mountain the Lord of hosts will make a feast, or make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine, of rich food full of marrow, of aged wine well refined. He will swallow up on this mountain the covering that is cast over all peoples, the veil that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever. And the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces. And the reproach of his people he will take away from all the earth. For the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, Behold, this is our God. We have waited for him that he might save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. So Paul says, this is when that promise will finally be fulfilled at the very end of time when the last trumpet is sounded, and then shall come to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. This passage, death, where is your victory? Death, where is your sting? It's interesting. If you go back to Hosea where it's found, um, it's actually God taunting sinful Israel. They are being, or he is punishing them for their wickedness. And when he says, oh, death, where is your victory? Death, where is your sting? It's like, oh, soldier, where is your sword? Where is your shield? Come and do battle. Come and wreak vengeance on my people. So he's calling death and destruction to come out and render judgment on his people. But now do you see in this text that verse is being turned on its head to where Paul says now through Jesus Christ, death is coming under judgment. Thanks be to God who gives us the victory for our Lord Jesus Christ. So through Jesus' death and Jesus' resurrection, he has destroyed the one who can wield sin as a weapon of death and has delivered us over to a victory that is so certain. Do you notice Paul doesn't speak of it as happening in the future? Thanks be to God who will give us the victory. He speaks of it as happening right now. Thanks be to God who gives us the victory. Paul can do this in part because even right now, of course, you and I enjoy a new life in him as well. We are redeemed from our sins. But also because this victory that is yet to come is so certain 
You can speak of it as if it's already here. It is such a guaranteed thing that it's a reality already. And since you and I have received that kind of victory in Jesus, then here's what we do in response. Verse 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast and movable. You remember how the chapter starts? I would remind you, brethren, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and which you stand and by which you're being saved, if you hold fast. Be steadfast and immovable. Always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. And once again, earlier, Paul's worried they're going to believe in vain. He said, if Christ is not raised from the dead, your faith is in vain. Paul's preaching would be in vain. All his labor is everything in vain. But because Christ has been raised, all our faith and teaching and work, it's not in vain. Which is the lesson of the resurrection. What you and I do in this body makes an eternal difference. Because one day this very body is going to be raised and transformed. So to use Paul's analogy here, I imagine everybody spent at least a few moments, perhaps more than a few, over this past holiday, mindful of the loved ones who are no longer there and couldn't come to Thanksgiving because of that. And even for all the different bodies you were able to hug this week, you couldn't hug theirs because that body has been has been temporarily given back to the one who gave it. Paul says, thanks be to God. Thanks be to God that you and I know, based on what Paul says in this text, that when Jesus returns, there's something so much greater in store for those who have gone on before. And a reunion like you and I can't imagine awaits us which allows that sorrow that you might have felt throughout the past few days and would probably feel throughout many holiday season to be mixed with joy and also with a deep, resonating gratitude as we give thanks to God who gives us and them the victory through Jesus Christ. No, oh, I know we are very mindful of the fact that the world in which we live, in this world, death is an ever-present reality. But this is also a world in which the resurrection from the dead and our victory over death, Paul says, is as good as here already. Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. If by chance you are not a Christian this evening, or your faith is wavering, please understand the hope and the victory that Jesus offers. If you need to repent of your sins and declare your faith in Him and be baptized into Him, you can receive not only the gift of the Spirit, Acts 2, but also one day the gift of a spiritual body that's fit for the presence of God. And if by chance your faith has wavered, and this isn't a hope you've taken firm possession of, I hope you'll repent of those sins and re-declare your faith in Him. However, we might help you to take hold of the hope that Christ offers you. Please let us know if we stand.